All right, that was my soapbox. Now, I, I really began to think, Dr. Cho was here last week and he was talking to us and I was so blessed by what he had to say because he talked about how his church, the Lord said, well, can you believe, again, you may have a feeling about big churches, whatever, you know, whatever your feeling is, but he is basically are built through cell groups and home groups. And uh, he began to talk about how the church, you know, can you believe for 3,000? Can you believe for 6,000? Well, can you believe for 100,000? Can you believe for 200,000? Can you believe for 600,000? Now they're at 700,000 plus, close to a million. And uh, they've st years ago started their own newspaper. Well, that never was important to me until November when the newspaper locally here just bashed the revival big time here. And I was thinking, you know, I'm not trying to raise an insurrection or fight my own battles, but I'm thinking, you know, if we Christians, instead of parting hair over things, would have gotten together under the blood of Jesus, Baptists, Methodists, Pentecostals, Charismatics, all of us, instead of, instead of keeping our divisions going, if we could have gotten together, we probably could have owned television stations and newspapers, and we probably would have been very irrelevant what CNN was even putting out, because it wouldn't matter. But, but we haven't done that. We've forfeited our birthright over to the world and said, you can have it. And, and, and now we're suffering consequences of it. But still, I believe that everything happens under the sovereignty of the Lord. And I believe that the Lord is going to see this thing through. He started the church. I didn't. And He's going to see us through. And He's going to bring us through. And there's going to be an awakening. There is an awakening starting. I was in Europe in December. Uh, again, on our break, we had a two-week break. We went to England to preach. But, yeah, no, it's crazy, isn't it? But when I went over there, there was such a hunger. And I, I don't know if Andy has been, but there is such an intense hunger in the churches to see God just wake that place up. Because they're, they're, they're very religious but there, there's not a lot of reality in it. And God's, I think God's seeking to just ignite the place. And I think we're going to see places start to rise up. Now, do I think everything will look like Brownsville? And this is what I wanted to say to you this, mo this morning. A lot of you going home from here, you know, last night I closed, and uh, some of you were sleepy, but it was my desire that all of us worshipers get together and you know, you may or may not use flags in your church. You may or may not use banners. Uh, well, the funny thing about it is I don't even like those flags. And why I got one last night and ran with it, I'll never understand. It's, it's just, no, I mean that. It's probably one of the most distracting things when I'm trying to worship to see those things flying all over the place. But I just, I know there's something to it that I don't understand. And I know it's in the Word of God, and I don't suppose to understand intercessors. I don't understand intercession. I don't understand prophecy. I, I wish I could. I wish I could stand up and just give you this great dissertation. But, you know, what I've learned is, is uh, what Craig said, the, ba the guy playing bass the other day, is not to basically eliminate anything, but to stay open and say, Lord, Whatever you want to do within, you know, as long as it's within the context of Scripture and as long as it's not some wild her heretical doctrine that just doesn't exist in the Word of God, if it agrees with the basic creeds that our fathers have laid down and it doesn't violate those, somebody doesn't start teaching that, that, that there's another Jesus besides the one of the Scripture, if it doesn't get all haywire, then I'm not going to close myself in or down. And when I go to a vineyard service, I'm going to worship with them. When I go to an Episcopal service, I'm going to worship with them. I want to learn. I just want to be a sponge. And tonight, I was just hoping that all of us would just sponge up what the Lord's doing. Now, going home and trying to practically apply some of the things that we're doing at conference, depending on your pastor, or how your church is set up, you may not be able to do that, but let me let you know something. It's not your job to change the church. The Lord sends you to the church to change you. And always keep in mind that you work, yes, but always keep in mind that you work under the headship of the body. And the Lord has put shepherds over the flock and to tend the flock, and you don't violate their vision ever. 
I'm so tired of getting calls from pastors saying, listen, my music guy's trying to bring in this stuff that they learned down there, and it's just not working at our church. You know, don't go home and force feed the saints in something that they don't want to eat. You know, another thing is, and, and I felt like we should cover these, and I'm going to shut up, but the other thing is, you know, gain a friendship with your pastor. How many music directors do we have here, or worship leaders, whatever you do in the church? Your best friend should be your pastor. And you should make time with him and interrupt his life and say, look here, doctor. I am here to work with you. And when we get up in the service, the way we have Western American church, the way the Western country here does church, is the pastor and the music guy are the, are the, have the biggest time slot in the whole service that happens weekly. If they're not friends and on the same page, there's a problem. Because you're trying to pull somebody over here to your agenda, and he's got a vision for the church, and the, you're pulling against each other. And that's why pastors hate musicians so much. Because sometimes we get bullheaded and we want to take the church somewhere. And that's why I get these people come up to me all the time going, Man, Wendell, I'm trying to sing this song and I'm trying to lead the people into the intimacy of the Lord and they just don't want to go there. Well, have you considered that possibly up until the time you were the music director, they sang I'll Fly Away? You ain't going to be able to abandon everything and just jump into something new and expect the saints to jump in with you. Especially if they don't like you. The saints in the pew are not your enemies. And when I came to Brownsville, this is and was, well, it was before revival, past tense, a very traditional church. You can ask any of these singers here. We did songbook songs. Uh, we did a lot of integrity stuff. And, and the worship leader before me actually brought in the, the, like worship courses. Before that, it was pretty much songbook songs and choir songs. And I came in here, and my aim is I looked at every gray-haired lady and man in this place, and I thought, they're going to be my buddies. But see, but see, because I remember growing up, my grandmother used to sit on the front row, and she was 80-something years old. And she grew up in a different world than I grew up in. She grew up in Mayberry. <laughs> she did. She grew up, when my grandmother, when you went to her house, it was typical grandmother thing. You know, I was watching the news a couple days ago, and they were talking about this alternative family kind of stuff. You know, people's lost grip on what a family is, a mom and dad and children. And now we're deciding that two lesbians or two homosexuals can be a family if they have adopted children or if they've done the surrogate thing, and it's okay, and it's just we got to learn to be tolerant of all this. And grandmother would flip a wig over that because she grew up in Mayberry. She grew up where where you could leave your door unlocked all night. Uh, she grew up where you didn't worry about anything. Uh, it was worry-free. It was a wonderful, wonderful thing. And you know what? I, the Lord, Andy, so funny how the Lord will direct you. I started this service. Now, when I came down here, I didn't want this job. You remember that. So I had all these white folks trying to do all this black music, and it was really coming out awful. And, but it was so radically different for the church that they were looking at me going. And my hair was like way on down. And that was on purpose too because I thought, if they see me with long hair, and I'll, they'll never hire me. They'll never hire me. And I was hoping they wouldn't. But see, pastor had heard from the Lord. I hadn't. And I came down here, and the more, the more crazy I got, the more they liked it. And I thought, man, this is not working. The reverse psychology isn't working here. Let me turn back around. So when I finally surrendered to come here and felt like the Lord had sent me, the first thing I want to do was make the saints that have been in this church. See, those people were here. This, is a, this church was founded in 1939. We've got people on the pews in this church that have been here since it began. Now, do I want to abrupt them? Now, throw them away? You know, as much as I love vineyard music, this is not a vineyard church. I went to Andy's church on Sunday morning, and I wore shorts and, and, and my Birkenstocks and a T-shirt. It was fun. <laughs> I would never do that here. Not because of religion, 
but because of respect for the culture and respect for the older folks that are here that expect their young man who's leading worship to have a necktie on on Sunday. Now, I, I push the envelope the rest of the week, but on Sunday morning, I wear a tie, not because I'm religious, not because I think it's a holy thing, but yet because it's respect for the elders of the church. Now, my grandmother used to love the old songs like Just Over in the Glory Land and all those great old songs and their camp meeting songs. Well, if you listen to any Brownsville worship for very long, if you're in a service with us, you're going to find out that they're going to make their way in. Now, you may not recognize them, But they're going to make their way. We just did a recording of the, of the, of the pastor's conference last, uh, b last November. And it was so funny. We had this whole list of all this new stuff we were going to do. And I started worshiping. And it's in my blood. I can't help it. I started doing uh, take your burdens to the Lord and leave them there. Because it's in me. It's part of me. It's my heritage. And I try to always remember that grandma is probably there whether she's mine or somebody else's and I want to make sure she has her chance to worship too so I try to include something that she would worship to now I'm not worried about you you're musicians I'm not trying to make grandma happy this week you know but I want her to I want grandma to be able to get into the worship and something that'll ring her bell and move her to worship at the same time, I've got all these kids up here that are coming out, you know, they're coming with earrings everywhere and, and tattoos and, and, you know, pink hair and it's just fun, you know. And, and I don't want them to feel like I expect them to put on a necktie to be a Christian either. I want them to just enjoy it too, so I'll do History Maker and every move I make and we'll, when Glenn's here, we'll just peel the paint off the wall with a guitar. I mean... But the thing of the first time Glenn came, we did that song you did last night. We did, uh, when you were here, was the first time Glenn was here. And we did, uh, what was the tune we did last night? It's got the great solo in it. I see the Lord. And you know what was so funny is our church, again, up till that point, that was in 96, the revival hadn't been, I hadn't been here but about a year. And I had never really tried a guitar here. And, and actually have been told not to. Not by the pastor, but by a lot of folks who were trying to help me out. That, <laughs> that I really didn't want to try. And so when Glenn took off, I kind of crossed my fingers and went, all right, here we go. We're going to find out now. And the minute he started the solo, because Glenn doesn't play from a performance standpoint, Glenn plays from the spirit. And when he starts to play it, it doesn't really matter the sound it has. The worship, it just kind of breaks loose stuff. And when he started that solo, the people had kind of been okay with the whole song. But, I mean, when they, we got to that point, they stand and just, you can hear it on the recording of volumes, uh, Winds of Worship 7. Yeah! And I'm going, well, I guess guitars are okay. <laughs> you know? But you've got to, I just wanted to say to you, you've got to trial and I don't want you going home and, and, and ripping your church apart. I want you to find the place, first of all, befriend the people. I was going to tell you, I'm closing with this, but the, about the third Sunday I was here, I gave that whole May Mayberry thing. And the Lord just told me to do it. And I stood up at that pulpit on a Sunday morning and looked out across Brownsville before all the visitors were coming. It was just us. And I said, can I tell you something? I miss Mayberry because I grew up in a small town in North Alabama. And you could leave your, your doors open, too. And, and my grandmother, when you went to her house, it was just typical grandmother fare. She made chicken and dumplings, coconut cream pies. And if she heard you were coming, it was all going to be laid out. And, and, and Benny and I are always joking about, she, did you eat, honey? You better eat. You'll get hungry. <laughs> I ate. I got about this big. And I looked out and I said, you know, I wish we could go back to homemade quilts. And they all got really excited because I knew about these things because I grew up in the country a little bit, you know. And I, my, my uncle used to churn butter and, and he had his own cows. And, and so I'm a little bit of a country boy too. And so, you know, because I didn't look like it. 
And I just started talking to these people going, you know, I wish we could go back to churning our butter, having a cow. You know, let's go out to the hen house and get some fresh eggs every morning and fry them up and have some grits and hash browns and, you know, you get hungry, aren't you? <laughs> now, if you're not from the South, you have no idea what grits are and you don't have an appreciation for them. But you see, that's your misfortune. The Lord is Southern. You understand that. Uh, <laughs> And contrary to popular belief, he speaks with a southern accent. He would never say use. It's y'all or nothing, folks. But, uh, but I begin to talk about that just from my heart. And I, I begin to talk about how I missed that myself, and I do. And I said, but you know what, guys? The world we live in is different. We've got kids who can, with two keystrokes, be into anything in the internet that, 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 that grandmother would have died. She would have, she would have never allowed it to even be in her house. Our kids can access it that quick. At a moment's notice, they can have every information available and known to man on their little computer in their home. They have things at their fingertips. It's a different world. It's a very wicked world. It's not a safe world like it used to be. It's not. It's gone. And I said to the saints, I said, you know, you can either grieve over what's gone, and we can become, the church can become a museum for the saints, that we can all look at who's gone by and how great things used to be, or we can become a birthing room. Now, if we become a birthing room, it's going to be messy, loud, noisy, and unpredictable. And I, I, I let them know. I said, I'm going, to, I'm going to gear the music to where I never leave the saints gone by out. But I'm also going to go a different direction sometimes. You buckle up with me and just know that I love you and that I'm not trying to take you somewhere you don't want to go. I want you to go there with me because... While you can worship to Amazing Grace and get a, you can get a bump over it. I can hear Amazing Grace and get bumps. I mean, I'm just like, because I grew up with that heritage. These kids up here in the front that are coming out of the streets and they're coming from broken homes, they have no idea. Amazing Grace don't mean a thing to them. They'll get a bump over every move I make more than they will Amazing Grace. It's a cultural change that's going on. And the South is probably the slowest to catch it. But, you know, if you'll hang with me, folks, I'll try to make sure that we include you too. So if you'll do me a favor, when we hit something that you don't like musically, instead of pruning up your face, just go, yeah, even if you don't get it. Because these kids like your music too. They don't know it, but they like it. They're open. And man, the result, is, is, it speaks for itself. On Sunday morning, Glenn told me one time, he said, I like come to your church because I can do anything. There's nothing our church doesn't accept musically. I don't think there's anything that we could, any style we could pull out that they wouldn't go in, get into, and even the old folks. But you see, it's because you befriend them and you lead them. They'll follow a friend. But if they feel like you're a, you're a rebellious musician and you've got the spirit of Lucifer on you and you want your own way, they are not going to follow you. They are going to rebel you and buck you. And they're going to leave you in the dust, and you're going to be looking for another place to work in a few months. And you're not going to have comp accomplished your, your goal at all. Now, you may be lucky and live in California, the land of fruit and nuts, where <laughs> you can do anything and get away with it to a degree because it's a much more open culture. It's a melting pot culture. If you live on the East Coast in New York, you can get away with a lot of things. But if you're in the Bible Belt, Somebody said, we need to break that loose. We will, but we'll break it loose with friendship and kindness and loving on people. We won't break it loose by force feeding. We won't do it. I got to shut up. That was supposed to take five minutes, but I was waiting on the band to get in place. Hallelujah. Okay. Uh, uh, you know, right now would be a good time to sing a song. Let's sing a couple of songs, and uh, I'm singing some stuff that's not on Brownsville CDs and stuff, and I know that, and, you know, I'm sorry. 
But uh, I've gotten really excited about the songs of awakenings from the church and uh, just really excited about it. And uh, I want Larry to get ready for a minute to just come and greet you, uh, tell you about something real exciting. And we're going to sing a couple of songs, and then Andy's going to come. We're going to give him a lot of time to share with us. I've been looking forward to this, too. Andy's got a gift of God with raising up people and, and, and delegating and, and raising up worship leaders, and that's something I want to hear myself. But, uh, but we got really excited about singing. We're putting out a, a, a new record called Send the Fire, and I'm not plugging the record. I'm just telling you I'm excited because I've gone back and found all these songs that were attached to moves of God. So we're singing songs from Mazusa Street. We're singing songs from the Welsh Revival. We're singing something, but we're kind of packaging them in a way that people can accept them along with what's going on now. And the song we sang the other night, Send the Fire, was written by William Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army. And William Booth was a man that was hungry after God and had a fire of God. And he was very avant-garde for his time, too, because horns were considered the devil's instrument. And he was out beating drums and having Salvation Army bands. Uh, I can't imagine William Booth jingling a bell by a little red pot. Uh, William, William, was, William was preaching fire and was preaching the judgment of God and preaching the love of God and telling the gospel and writing songs like Send the Fire. I love the, the lines, to burn up every trace of sin and to bring the light and glory in. The revolution now began. That's so relevant for now, and it's 100 years old. That's where we are, what we need. And I wanted to sing, uh, I did a little song. You heard the youth team do it, and I'm going to sing it real quick. Because of you. It's a little song I got when I was over in England, and a young man over in Ireland wrote it. And uh, he's part of what God's doing there, and I just love it, uh, especially when I get to that wedding and the feast. I just almost take off. Uh, but just sing along with us, and we'll sing a few choruses together, and then we'll, we'll move on. I'm so glad you're here. This is fun. God bless you. Sing, she preaches, and she does conferences. <laughs> Cheryl, do you play the piano? Well, that's going to say you slice, dice, play the piano. She's also the mother of two children. Three. Sorry. That's right. It's a Brownsville prerequisite. You have to have over two because we have to. Because of you. i 
There is peace, there is wine ever flowing. There's a wedding and there's a feast because of you. Because of you. Because of your love. Because of your love. Because of your blood. Because of your blood. Son of God, and I will worship at your feet, Lord. I will worship at your feet, Lord. I will sing the song of the redeemed on that day. Oh, I've been set free by the power of the blood. I am walking in the light of His word. I am free. I am free. Bless you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Jesus, we bless you, Lord. Here is love, vast as the ocean, loving kindness as the flood. When the prince of life our ransom shed for us his precious blood who is love will not remember who can cease to sing his praise he will never 
never be forgotten throughout its eternity. Fountains were open deep and wide Through the floodgates of God's mercy Poured a vast and gracious tide Grace and love like mighty rivers Poured in sense and from above Heaven's peace and perfect justice Kissed a guilty world in love Through many days. 
Have a seat. <clears throat> I believe the uh, title of our workshop this weekend is, uh, it's not a weekend, but it's called uh, Fulfilling Your Destiny as a Worship Musician. So uh, that's the title of my message for this morning. Uh, originally on the handout, I believe what it said was uh, how to organize and build a worship program, but Lyndall told me, just uh, do what's on your heart. Well, this is what's on my heart. These are the nine things that I'm most passionate about. I'm going to give you nine points. It's a combination of spiritual principles, character qualities, and practical application of how to do your worship ministry. Uh, Proverbs 4.23 says, Above all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. And so uh, a lot of these things I'm going to give you today are, are heart issues. And frankly, everything you do in a practical outworking will flow out of these principles. Um, you can figure out how to organize a worship program. Uh, if I got one shot, what I'm going to give you is, is the heart core issues that will enable you to not just fulfill your destiny as a worship musician, but as a worshiper in your whole life. Uh, the way I view my ministry is that I do music. It just so happened my mom got me into banjo lessons when I was nine years old. And then guitar later and then piano later. And so I happen to be a musician and that's one of the primary ways I express worship. But uh, that's just one of the ways. And uh, if you've ever read some of the prophets like Amos and Isaiah and Micah, you see how detestable it is to God when people worship musically, but th they don't do it with the rest of their lives. They, f they forget the oppressed and the poor, and they don't do justice. You know, what is the Lord required of, of us? It's to act justly and to love mercy. Uh, and so I'm going to talk about musical worship, but I'm going to talk about lifestyle of worship as well. Point number one, be a pursuer of God. Uh, I grew up in the Episcopal Church, but I didn't really ever know the Lord. At 17, the Lord found me. 
uh, just as I was entering university, and I got saved, and I came to know the Lord. I immersed myself in the Bible and in prayer and in fellowship, and uh, I never knew how alive the Bible could be. Uh, God really got a hold of me. It was a pretty dramatic thing that happened to me. My family thought I was nuts because I would stay home and fast and pray and read the Bible when everybody else was out partying. Uh, what quickly began to develop for me was hearing God's voice. This is a major theme of my life, and it infects uh, my music ministry. It, it affects where I've chosen to live, who I married. Uh, the Lord told me uh, Linda was the right one for me when I was away on a retreat. Uh, and uh, she was just my friend. So it was God's idea for us to get married. She thought she was going to be a single missionary to India, but God had other ideas. Uh, and uh, now she has six kids. She's definitely not single. She's definitely not in India, although our friends in India want her to be there. But uh, um, that's an example of the heart of worship that has brought me to the place that I am today. Listening to God's voice and doing what He tells me to do. That's what I was doing last night. Uh, we gave these guys a worship list, but I warned them. I gave them fair warning. It's a list, but just expect the order to be changed. And uh, we did about five or six songs that they didn't have charts for. Thankfully, Lyndall was backing me up, and he, he brought some charts to them and they can hear the music. I'm concerned to do what the Lord wants me to do. And uh, I've played too many songs that are nice songs, but weren't God's idea for that moment. Don't you hate that when that happens? Uh, your, your worship is cruising along, and God is with you, and people are engaged, and then the song that you thought was going to be so great that was the next one on your list and, and you were too proud to set it aside, even though right when you got there, it seemed, hmm, maybe this isn't the right thing to do. I've done that a lot of times. And then the worship nosedives. But you see, I went ahead and did it because I had gone to the trouble to prepare and rehearse the band. And I wanted to have my shot at showing that we were ready, you know. I can, think, I can remember a pastor's conference where I did that. And uh, it was okay, but it sure wasn't what it could have been. Uh, and so I want to listen to the Lord for His guidance, whether it's in writing songs, whether it's in moving. Uh, we're moving again to Canada in a few weeks. We've been in Anaheim, California for five years. Five years ago, the Lord said to me, when I was in Germany, He said to me, you've got five years. It's one of the clearest things I've ever heard, and I was shocked because, well, partly because I didn't know what He meant. I thought. Am, am I going to get hit by a bus in five years? Uh, kind of thought it meant a geographical move, and uh, I kept pursuing God on it. And over the years, it became more and more clear that we are to head back to Canada, where we spent seven years. And so all of my music ministry, as best as I can uh, manage it, it flows out of, God, what are you doing? Father, what are you doing? Help me to do it right along with you. Uh, and so that song, that set of three songs last night, ministering to the suffering people, one of those songs was a possibility. I didn't know if we were going to do it, but it was obvious that the Lord was doing it. Whatever song I was doing just prior to that song, I knew during that song that the next song should be this one for the broken and lonely and desperate. And so that's what I want to do. I want to do what the Lord's telling me to do. Being a pursuer of God uh, means hearing God's voice in, in lots of different ways. Let me give you a quote from Eugene Peterson, who is the one that wrote the uh, uh, paraphrase of the Bible called The Message. He says this about prayer. Prayer takes place in the middle voice. In grammar, the active voice is when we take action, and the passive voice is when we receive the action of another. 
but in the middle voice, we both act and are acted upon. We participate in the formation of the action and reap the benefits of it. We neither manipulate God nor are manipulated by God. We are involved in the action and participate in its results, but do not control or define it. My prayer times are a lot like that. I, I have a prayer list, uh, but it's usually just a mental one. Uh, and I want to hear from God. I want to let Him bring to mind things to pray about. Uh, whether it's, what should I do with my family this week? Um, or interceding for my leaders, uh, interceding for the missionaries I'm involved with. Uh, I, I try to get as much information out of God as I can. And when you're involved in ministry, you need marching orders, don't you? Uh, one of the, the problems we have especially as Americans, is that we're, we have a very self-sufficient, uh, independent kind of spirit that uh, is in our culture that can tend to infect the church. And by that spirit, we would say, well, I don't really need to pray because I've got it together. You know, I, I'm doing pretty good. I'm successful, and uh, I can cruise along okay. But I find that I can't really make it because what I do is so dependent on getting help from God. If I can't pray, then it's just a matter of time before I lose my edge and before I burn out. I don't know about you, but I'm really good at worrying. I'm really good at finding things to worry about. So I have to cast my cares on the Lord. Even though I have a really good life, I can find things to worry about. I'm one of those perfectionist people that likes everything just in its place, you know? I mean, I took one of those personality tests and they had three categories. I came out perfectionist in every category. I said to my wife, I can't understand that. She said to me, I can understand that. <laughs> I have six kids. How perfect do you think my home is? <laughs> so that's one of my areas of refining. I come home and the house is, you know, in a shambles and, and uh, I learned to be a Christian. <laughs> okay, so we're talking about being a pursuer of God. There's nothing like being in God's presence. Paul prayed for his churches that they would have the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that they would know him better. And that's... That's what happens here in the revival every night. People are getting to know Jesus better. Uh, I, I was on the plane on the way down here, and, and the Holy Spirit was really giving me faith for the time here as I was sitting on the plane, and he was reminding me how his favor, his compassion is towards this place. Um, and people get filled with God's power when they come here. Uh, it's a wonderful thing. We also need to get filled with God on our own. We need to go and meet with Him. Um, one of my favorite ways to do that is by playing piano uh, and just seeing what happens. Sometimes I write a song. Most of the time I just play and sing. Meeting with God, finding what songs are anointed for me in that context of being alone with Him. And then from that well of living water taking it to the, the body. We can't lead people in a place that we haven't gone ourselves. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. I find that if, if I'm getting filled up with the Word and with insight from God, it just kind of bleeds out of me when I'm around my worship team. If, if I'm living and breathing worship, it'll spill out onto them and influence them. It'll leak out of me in the form of prayers uh, during the worship time. And that, that will stimulate the body to worship. Another aspect of being pursuers of God is that we have to come as, as we are. We, we can't think that we're going to just get everything in our life right before we can come and pray. C.S. Lewis says, lay before him what is in us, 
not what ought to be in us. I mean, how many of you, even in your prayer times, you get lustful thoughts coming to you, you get proud thoughts, you get self-centered thoughts, I do. Just push them aside, just confess your sin and go on. Uh, prayer is nothing more than an ongoing and growing love relationship with God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The second point is having close relationships of accountability. Uh, over the last year and a half or so, I've, I've had a, a prayer partner. We've met about once every two weeks on average. First time I've really had a prayer partner in a long, long time. It's really been great. Uh, most of the time in past years, that kind of interaction for me has happened in the context of smaller group, you know, friends that are leaders. But I'll tell you, it, it's really a wonderful thing to get together with a brother who has a, a, a similar ministry, and we talk about the things we're struggling about. We yell at our kids too much. We, we get too impatient at home. We, um, uh, we have a road trip coming up, and, and this is what we need prayer about. We have these people uh, criticizing us, and we need to be able to respond to that in a godly way. We confess our sin to each other. There's great power in confessing sin and weakness. James 5.16, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Uh, and, and so, you know, if, if you know you're meeting with somebody and you got to be honest, that helps you stay accountable. If you've already confessed something for the 60th time, it makes you a little bit uh, more motivated so you don't have to do it the 61st. Another aspect of uh, those kind of relationships, I'm one of those high achiever kind of people. I'm very task oriented. And so it's easy for me to be so focused on the task that I forget about friendship. Uh, and what I'm learning more and more is that life is too short to not have close friends. Uh, and uh, I want to invest in friends that I'm going to have for the rest of my life. Uh, and, uh, and so, take time for that. Proverbs has a lot to say about friendship. In 1717, it says, A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. 27 verse 9 says, Perfume and incense bring joy to the heart, and the pleasantness of one's friend springs from his earnest counsel. I need counsel from my friends. We just had a, a difficult situation to deal with in, in the last city I was in. Uh, and I, I had to talk to my team about it, tell them, hey, this is, this is a difficult situation of some people that are attending this conference. Uh, I needed to talk about it. I needed to get it off my chest, be honest about it, not hide it. And even just in the telling of that, the burden was, was lifted significantly. Point three, know your biblical job description as a worship leader or as a worship team member. Whether you're a drummer, a sound man, a dancer, a flag waver, uh, you have to know what are you doing that, that uh, has relevance to the biblical mandate for worship. We're doing more than playing enjoyable music, uh, obviously. So if you're part of an, an overall team, what is the mandate that, that that overall team has? Because if you're a part of that team, then you're, you contribute to that vision. And if you know what that vision is, then you'll know how to appropriately play, sing, dance, mix sound, whatever it is. Let me give you five biblical role models that worship leaders and worship team members fall into. The first one is the Old Testament model of priest. It's similar to what we do because we are bringing people to God. Now, of course, in the Old Testament, the priest was uh, required and was actually a mediator between God and the people. We're not a mediator, but we are a facilitator. We, as worship leaders, have the... Uh, 
privilege and the gift of bringing God and His people together, facilitating communion between God and His people. Uh, and that's an awesome thing, to, to be the one, to be the team that is the turning point for intimacy with God to happen. The turning point for uh, people to have a revelation of who God is. And so, uh, you have a priestly role. That's, a, that's an honored role. The last four roles are all from Ephesians 4, the equipping uh, roles that you find there. The first one being prophetic. What we're doing as worship people is pro proclaiming prophetically what God is saying. And so as I prepare my worship list, I'm not just preparing it w with a view towards what should we sing to God. I'm preparing it with a view towards what does God want to say to us on this particular day. Last night we got into a, a stream of the holiness, awesomeness, transcendence of God with with the song from the book of Revelation and with the song from Isaiah 6. And we weren't done with the holiness yet. And so I had to pull one out of the hat, exalt the Lord, the slow one in E minor, for the Lord our God is holy. Because God was proclaiming to us His holiness. <laughs> that was prophetic. Doesn't matter how many times you've sung a song, if that's what God wants to say about himself at that moment, it becomes prophetic. Because what is prophecy anyway? It's, it's a word from God for the people at a particular moment in time that strengthens, encourages, and comforts them. And it reveals more of the nature of who God is. And so that's why the, the team has to be flexible because we don't know exactly what what all God's gonna want to say what right when we get in, into it until we're there it's an amazing thing to be a mouthpiece for the prophetic word of God as a drummer you're part of that as an organist you're part of that the next role teaching we teach people who God is we put doctrine into people's heads when we choose our song list and sing those songs. I mean, those last hymns that we just sang, I mean, that proclaims the basic essence of what the gospel is. And so, you know, if you have 30 minutes of platform time, you, you are explaining to the church who Jesus is and what their responsibility is as a believer. That has as much doctrinal impact as the preaching does. It's powerful. You, you have a role of teaching. Another aspect of your teaching is to actually model the act of worship. People watch you worshiping and they learn how to worship. And the ones that seem to be just staring and sort of scratching their heads, that's okay. They're just learning. Your role is to teach. So you don't have to freak out when, when a third of the congregation is sort of <laughs> looking at you funny. They don't know what you're doing. They don't know what they should do. Uh, for different reasons, some of them just know what they should do. They just don't want to go there. But others of them are just learning. You know, and and they, need a, they need a model. They need somebody to demonstrate it. The last, uh, the uh, fourth in the list here is evangelism. We're convincing people that Jesus is Lord by the songs that we do. You have an evangelistic task when you're leading worship, bringing people just a little s step closer to making that decision to receive Christ. And it's not easy to measure, is it? Because people don't come up afterwards and say to us, you know what? I don't, I'm not a Christian yet, but I'm a little bit closer. They don't come up and say that. But that's happening. That is happening. Some people actually cross over the line when in the middle of worship. The last thing, and Lindell was really keen on this in his message today about being pastoral in your worship leading. The Vineyard is a young movement. It's only a little over 20 years old. But you know what? We have 
traditional vineyard, and we have 90s cutting edge vineyard, and everything in between. You know, we have about 500 vineyards in the States, and they are all over the map in terms of how they do worship. Our particular church in Anaheim has people that were there from the beginning, 20 years ago. They like early 80s vineyard worship. Now, they, they like some of the 90s stuff too, for sure. But in order to be a pastoral worship leader, I have to consider them. I have to realize what, what did they grow up on? What were they weaned on? What songs were so precious to them when they first found God? When they first found that intimate knowledge of Jesus? And so we have to work some of those songs in this part of being pastoral as worship leaders. Now, the next point in knowing your role, knowing your biblical role as a worship team member or leader, is to work hard at making a quality musical presentation. Uh, my band doesn't practice very much. We show up at 8.30 on a Sunday morning to rehearse for the 10 a.m. service. But they're all at least semi-professional in their skill level, and we've been playing together, most of us, for four or five years. And they know my repertoire, and so they do a good job with that much rehearsal. It's similar to here. This is unusual, though. Most churches aren't this big, and you don't have this high of a caliber of musicians. And so what I would say to you is practice as needed. Uh, it might be an hour a week. It might be while people are laying on the floor. That's when you do your practicing. I don't know. Practice as needed. Uh, if you're a, in a brand new situation and working with a brand new team, maybe you, you need to have one, one practice a week for the first three to six months that you're there. Uh, and so do it as needed. Next point, make the worship time accessible for congregational participation. Now, it, it's definitely uh, unusual for me to be in a place where there's no projection of the words. But I don't think that you're having a problem worshiping, frankly. <laughs> uh, it stretches my paradigm, but uh, you know what? It's working. Uh, now, my, my opinion is that it's preferable to have words up there uh, because I want the people to not be spectating. I'm, I want them to be worshiping. But th this is just a great example of how it's so easy to get attached to the outward form of something that we're doing in regards to worship. And getting so attached to, is there an overhead? Is there a songbook? Is there anything? that we miss the essence of what worship is. I mean, the essence of what worship is has been happening here the last few days. And so, be happy. Uh, and I can remember in 1983 when I first introduced the drums, a whole drum set into Sunday worship, saying to the drummer, I just play quiet because I don't want it to be... <laughs> I don't want it to be a concert. I want this to be worship. See, you've got to realize that in the vineyard, our worship experience arose out of kind of a reaction to the concert uh, approach to music. We didn't want to have, have a, a room full of spectators. We wanted everyone to be the, the band, to be the orchestra, worshiping all together, pointed towards God. So we were kind of paranoid about doing anything that would attract any attention to the stage. But frankly, whenever you add something new, for a while, it's going to attract attention. Because it's a new form of worship. It's a new element. But, I mean, how crazy would it be now to not have drums? For me, it's the backbone, it's the rhythm, you know, rhythmical backbone of what we do. Uh, that's just because once something becomes a part of your worship vocabulary, it doesn't become distracting and it just sort of fades into the background. And so, again, as pastoral worship leaders, we have to decipher how much new stuff can we add, how quickly, and, 
amen, Lyndall, don't go home and, and tear apart your church by trying to teach them 10 new songs that you heard at the conference. Uh, we, we have to be careful. We have to go gradually and, and uh, with respect for the traditions in which we minister. Another point I have here in, in our biblical mandate is stimulate, don't manipulate. I think what we do here in, in our worship leading is we get into it as leaders. We go for it. And naturally, there is a motion that, that comes into what we're doing. I mean, if the first commandment is love God with all your strength, soul, might, then shouldn't there be some emotion in worship? Yes. But you sh we shouldn't be working up emotions for the sake of emotions. It should be out of the natural outflow of worship. And so we don't need to manipulate people. We don't need to get them in a, in a headlock to try to make them worship. Uh, my approach is people are there to worship, and so I'm going to do it with all my might. And... Uh, hope that they come along with me. An interesting thing about the biblical psalms is that, uh, you see, the, the literary form of the psalms uh, was a common thing in the ancient Near East. There were the biblical psalms and there were the Babylonian psalms and other psalms. One thing that distinguishes the biblical psalms from the other cultures is that the biblical psalms have imperatives to worship. And so there's, there's commands in the biblical psalms. Praise the Lord. It, it, it's a command to the people of God to praise the Lord. So it's a very biblical thing to exhort people to worship. But I think it's just best to not beat them over the head. Uh, but to just encourage them and, and, again, be a facilitator, be a midwife of the worship process. Uh, because uh, if, if I have to um, twist somebody's arm, arm behind their back, then to me, I'm just wondering if, if it's really something they've chosen to do and, and whether or not it has integrity if they haven't chosen to do it themselves. Okay, those are the first two points. They took longer than the other points are going to take. Uh, point number three is exalt God, not yourself. We've already touched on this. But it's so important because the glory of God is here. We're doing a beautiful, musical, artistic thing. It's just easy to start thinking you're good, isn't it? Uh, it's easy to start thinking, hey, my voice sounds good. Hey. How am I looking? You know, I have not overcome that weakness of flesh in 20 years of worship leading. I don't know about you, but uh, I, have, I have not conquered my flesh yet. And it's easy for me to, to spend way too much time thinking about how I look. Uh, and uh, I'm not talking about what I wear. I mean, in the vineyard, we don't care what we wear. I'm talking about <laughs> how I look musically, how I sound. Uh, and, uh, I mean, if you can believe it, this is dressed up for me, you know. So, uh, <laughs> you guys aren't dressed up, so I, I feel pretty comfortable. But um, Part of the whole Lucifer syndrome is that he, he became enamored with himself. And uh, I'll tell you something. When you're up in front of a bunch of people, they're looking in your direction. You're the one with the mic. It's just easy to do that. And, and so, you know, we just got to keep humbling ourselves over and over again. When we gain a high position, we can come to value that position more highly than we value our relationship with God. Paul said uh, in Galatians chapter 1, in, in regards to uh, the legalistic works of the Pharisees, he said, Am I now seeking human approval or God's approval? Or am I trying to please people? If I were still pleasing people, I would not be a servant of Christ. Uh, you know, it takes a lot of energy, doesn't it, to worry about, am I pleasing the people enough? I just don't even go there. Uh, I'm just 
thankful that I am in sync with the, the overall vision of worship for my church. I'm in sync with the pastor's vision for what worship is. And uh, you know what? If there's people that don't like it, they can go find an, a church that worships like they want to worship. And all of us, I mean, I, I just have way too much anxiety to have to do it another way. We have a saying in the vineyard, you know, okay, here's the sign on the bus. This is where the bus is going. If you want to go, go there with us. Just hop on the bus. But you know what? There are other buses, and they're all going to end up in heaven. And if you'd rather take a different route, that's okay. We, we try to bless people and allow them to find the bus that best suits them. Proverbs 27, 21, the crucible for silver and the furnace for gold, but man is tested by the praise he receives. You know, a, a human tendency is that we want to make heroes. And our church, some of, some of our church members will make heroes out of us if we let them. They, they will move things in that direction. And so we have to do whatever we can to defer uh, and just cause that hero, that adulation, that uh, idolizing to just kind of go by the wayside and just try as hard as you can to walk in humility. Here's a uh, quote from Cornell West on humility. True humility means two things. One, a capacity for self-criticism. The second feature is allowing others to shine, affirming others, empowering and enabling others. Those who lack humility are dogmatic and egotistical. That masks a deep sense of insecurity. They feel the success of others is at the expense of their own fame and glory. That relates to another one of my points, which is very important to me, which is don't make the mistake of Saul. Saul had a, a young, gifted leader that came up named David. He was jealous of David. Uh, jealous was more highly acclaimed. Uh, and so Saul became insane in his desire to um, remove David and little, literally to murder him. Uh, we don't go that far mostly in, in our jealousy, but normally it would be more with a spear of words rather than a, an actual spear. And so we have to do whatever we can to keep repenting from jealousy over young gifted leaders that God is raising up and instead to be part of, of the force that helps them get raised up. Uh, and so I've had to be relentless in my repentance over that issue. And God gave me a test in, in the um, mid-80s on that when the man I had raised up, Brian Dirksen, became huge in, in vineyard worship internationally. And I, I had to decide, okay, am I going to rejoice about this or am I going to be jealous about it? And there was a struggle. You know, I had to repent over and over again for those feelings of, of jealousy that I had. Now, am I successful as a worship leader? Yes. I mean, in terms of if you want to use the uh, classical uh, American definition of success because I sing in front of a lot of people and I, I write a lot of songs that get recorded. Uh, and so, even though I have that amount of success, why, why should I be threatened by another anointed successful worship leader? Well, what it shows you is that it doesn't matter how successful you are if, if you haven't gotten rid of that jealousy, envy, uh, then it doesn't that matter how great you are. There's always going to be somebody that can do something a little better, you know? Uh, and so, uh, you know, I had to at one point tell Brian, you know what, I have these crazy, you know, feelings of jealousy and envy. Please pray for me. And uh, that's just part of our human makeup. We all want to look good. We all want to excel. We all want to progress. And uh, we tend to compare ourselves with one another. What are some of the ways you can battle that? One is compliment others, affirm them. Give them a chance to do your job. Uh, I had a great model for that, you know, in the pastor that I had in Langley. Uh, and he, he shared the platform. And uh, so I 
gradually gave Brian half of the worship leading because I knew I was going to be going to pastor another church. Uh, but you know, it wasn't easy to do that. And it's, it has, it's never real easy. I mean, we like to lead. If you're a leader and you love doing that and that's what you're gifted at, you like doing that. And so it's, it's a conscious choice to give it away. But you know what? I want to raise up other worship leaders so the whole world can be full of worship leaders. We're a church planting movement. Uh, I've been in three countries in the last month and a half pioneering uh, worship and training worship leaders in those countries. And so the biggest part of my job is not just worship leading, but it's train, uh, training others to lead worship. And that, that does not always come naturally. And so, uh, avoiding the error of Saul is so important. The fifth point, fulfill your calling. Trust God for your place in the body. One of the stops along the way for me was Santa Barbara. I was there for about a year and a half. And uh, I was only in my mid-twenties when I got there. And uh, there was a worship leader there at the time, and I thought he, what he did was kind of silly. I mean, I did not like the songs he sang, so I'd just stand in the back of the church kind of with my arms folded, just, what is he doing? You know, it's kind of like that attitude. And uh, I was trying to figure out, God, what have you called me to in my life? I was not a career pastor or worship leader. I did not see myself as fitting the profile of what a staff pastor should be. I thought, where do I fit? I mean, sure, I can lead worship, but I mean, what, so what? Uh, and so, God just sort of has a destiny for us, you know? And if, if your definition of success is doing the big gigs, then you might just have a real hard time. My definition of success is obedience to God. And wherever obedience to God takes you, that's success. And uh, my wife uh, devotes her life to raising our six kids. She's being successful as a worshiper because she's raising disciples of Christ. And uh, her reward in heaven will be at least as good as mine is, I think. Probably better. She doesn't mind a messy house. <laughs> tell you, if I had to do her job, I couldn't keep the house clean. I like to uh, look at 1 Peter chapter 4 in regards to each of us doing our particular role. And this is so important. Uh, if you want to turn there, 1 Peter 4 verse 7. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be clear-minded and self-controlled so that you can pray. Above all, love each other deeply. I'll say that again. Above all, love each other deeply. Because love covers over a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each one should use whatever gift he has to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks... He should do it as one speaking the very words of God. If anyone serves, he should do it with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. What are some key points here? Number one, each one has different gifts. We're all different. In, in the musical training you had, or lack thereof, uh, your socioeconomic level, you, you couldn't determine that. But you can determine the attitude you have now in using whatever gifts God's given you. I mean, I, I was gifted with music lessons from an early age. Uh, but we all didn't get that. What, what else does it say? It says we have received the gifts. They're not something we've mustered up. It's a gift from God. He's the one that gives out the gifts. What does it say that the purpose of the gifts is? It's so that we can serve the body with the gifts to benefit others. Finding self-fulfillment really isn't at the top of the list. It's, it's for the purpose of serving others. What do we do with these gifts? Give them away. Faithfully administer God's grace. 
All we can do is give away what we have, you know? That's all we can do. We can't be somebody else. I can't be Lyndall, he can't be me. We have different gifts. All we can do is take those packages we get and hand them out. Give it away. Whatever you got, give it away. It says, if, you got, if, if anyone serves, he should do it with the strength God provides. I can't minister in the strength God provides to Lyndall and vice versa. I can only do it in my kind of strength that God gives me. And what's the result of that? So that in all things, God may be praised through Jesus Christ. That's the result. It's not about us. It's about Him. It's all about you, Lord, right? Okay. Point six. Persevere through the difficult times. And the first point under that is handle criticism graciously. Do you have any people in your church that really love how the last worship leader before you did it? And they love all the old songs. They love how it used to be. One guy came up to me a year or so ago, and he had a good heart. He, this guy wasn't hard to talk to, but he said, you know, with so-and-so, the, the last worship leader, every Sunday I could get into the presence of God. You know? <laughs> you know, but this guy, he had a good attitude, you know, and what was my job at that point? Just listen and love him, you know? Now, other people aren't that easy. There was an older gentleman one time during the rehearsal, he came up and his eyes were bulging, man. And uh, these drums are killing us, you know, is what he said. <laughs> the drums can't kill you here because they're in a cage. <laughs> I mean... I'm used to having the drums about 10 feet from me with, with usually no cage, so. Uh, poor Chester, he's, he's in a cage. <laughs> Every time, you know, we have this little screen. It's about this high, plexiglass thing. If, if that's ever set up in front of our drums, my main drummer walks in and he goes, Ah! The screen! You know, it's... If you're a rock drummer, man, you, that's a hard thing. That, that's a servant drummer right there. He's, he's willing. <laughs> and see, that, that again, that's just another of various models we have of how do we arrange our, our whole musical setup from one church to another. It's just it's different all over the place. Uh, and so, we need to respond kindly, even to the rabble who want the old food from Egypt. Uh, the next point. <laughs> the next point. <laughs> How many of you, uh, once in a while, you don't really feel like going to church? You don't really feel inspired? Uh, you get out your master song list, and you, you look at all those songs, and you think, oh, my Lord, is there anything on there that has life in it for today? <laughs> uh, you know, I've felt like that a lot of times. And uh, I got to the end of 1996, was feeling pretty tired, and I was praying about 97, and the Lord showed me a picture of a baseball pitcher on a mound, it was late in the game and the, bit, the pitcher was really tired. It was, looked like he was just dragging himself up to the mound. And the Lord said to me, just keep throwing pitches. Just get up there and deliver pitches and I'll give you the stuff you need. Amen to that? That is, uh, that is such a huge part of being in worship ministry because we don't always feel bubbling over with love for God. We, we just have to show up, walk up, step onto the mound, and deliver some pitches. And so much of the time, the stuff isn't there until the ball is coming out of your hand. You know, you feel so un 
into worship. Uh, and so I've been doing this more than 20 years, but I, I figure I got another 20 at least. Of course, I don't know how old I get before nobody wants to hear me lead worship, you know. <laughs> kind of the creaky old river is here guy. Oh, he's up there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We will ride, you know. <laughs> we will ride with our dentures. <laughs> well, I guess Frank Sinatra did okay. He got to 80, so uh, I don't know about that. But that's one reason we got to keep raising people up, isn't it? So. If I can do it another 20 or 30 years, then I will have completed the race. We're in it for the long haul. You know, when, when I was in high school, uh, I was on the football team for a while, but they never played me, so I quit. Uh, and, uh, but you know what? That's not how it is in church, is it? We're on the team for life in some church or another. We can't quit. We're part of the team. And uh, the Lord showed me another picture one time of, of, all, of this football team without numbers on their jerseys. And uh, they would score, and nobody knew who it was that scored. No numbers. It was unidentifiable. And uh, that's a picture of, of how we should rejoice because there's only one team in the body of Christ. There's one team on our, in our church and so, if, if God's being glorified, then we should rejoice. It doesn't matter who's scoring, right? And so, I want to be good at handing the ball off. I want to be good at, at uh, letting the other guy go in and quarterback for a while. And so, it's hard to persevere because it's a natural process that requires hard work. I like the picture of... Uh, collecting the manna in the wilderness. There was a supernatural activity, manna falling down from heaven. But what did it require in order to put that into usable uh, form? Well, you had to walk around every day and pick it up. A very menial, repetitive task. It was hard work interacting with the supernatural work of God. And that's just what we got to be prepared to do as worship people. Point seven, give with generosity. Giving is the essence of love. You can't love without giving. God says, if you want to be respected, give with generosity. Psalm 112, verse 9. He who gives generously to the needy and shows kindness will be powerful and respected. Here's an example. When Andrew Carnegie died, they opened his desk and found a piece of paper on which, as a boy, he had written his life's goal. In the first half of my life, I'm going to earn as much money as I can. In the second half, I'm going to give it away. He gave away at least $450 million. Another example, the Colombian scientist who developed the first vaccine against malaria, Dr. Manuel Elkin. Uh, Manuel Elkin Pataroyal is his name. He says that he will not sell his vaccine for the fortune it's worth. Malaria hits $300 million people a year and kills three million. Dr. Pateroyal says that he'll give the vaccine to the world for free. He could, have, he could have done pretty well on that vaccine, couldn't he? One more. Uh, on Rockefeller. The premier of France, referring to a large gift made some years before John D. Rockefeller for help in the restoration of the Reims Cathedral, quoted Rockefeller as saying, Use it in the unseen parts of the work, for you will find enough people who want you to use their money for what can be seen. So he was willing to donate to the foundation of the building, the, the concrete that nobody would, would see. You've got you to gotta give generously. If you're serious about being a worshiper, there's just no two ways around it. And so I've prayed over the years, God, make me a generous person, because I grew up very stingy. You know, saving every little penny. And so um, I've learned to be generous. I want to 
use my time, energy, and money to extend the kingdom of God however I can. And uh, that means giving away a lot of money. That means going to Madras, India, Hong Kong, and Mexico, which I've done in the last few months, to uh, give away worship to a place that doesn't have it, to, to help worship leaders take the next step up so that they can give that gift of worship. There's amazing things happening around the world with renewal worship. In Madras, India, they sell vineyard worship in the secular bookstores. Non-Christians buy our worship music there. And so you advertise that there's a vineyard worship thing and, and non-Christians come. Uh, and, and so uh, I love doing things like this, but you know what? My greatest passion is, is to go where the, the need is, is greater, frankly. Uh, and uh, to see Hindus come to know the Lord. And I'll tell you something, there's a lot of Hindus that are really open to Christ. Kind of like nominal cat, uh, Christians in our country here. They, they want a God of love, and they've never experienced it. And so I'm using my energy. I, I'm, I'm sacrificing time with my family to go on trips like that because I'm, I want to build something. I want to help build a movement that is going to save people. That's the big picture that we have to have as worship leaders. We're not just doing music. We are participating in reaching the lost. And uh, you know what resources God has given you. He's given me a lot of resources in different ways. Uh, spiritual gifting, but also freedom to take two weeks and go do something. And so I want to do that. I want to invest in something that is going to be eternally fruitful. I want to have a world vision. Uh, I don't want to have a little narrow view of, of just my own local church. And so in Mexico, I mean, the, the church there, people are being added to it, you know, every week. Uh, and uh, I tell you something, it's about eight levels down from this in, in musicality. But uh, they need some help. You know what? It's not a glamorous place to go, even though it is a destination of many uh, vacationers down there where I went. But uh, I want to I find out, God, how can I best use my time? All of us have to do that. The last point, don't forget your family. You can't be a worshiper uh, unless you love your family. Having uh, my kids is, is really a wonderful thing, uh, but it's also a really challenging thing because they're raising me. <laughs> they're helping me grow up. All, all of the immaturities I have, they come out more than any place with my kids. I have great kids. I mean, I, I don't mind bragging on them a little bit. They, they are really good kids, but they aren't adults. Can you believe it? They act like children. <laughs> I mean, I've got some great stories. I, uh, any pastors here whose kids lie, cheat, and steal like mine? <laughs> isn't that great? Is, isn't that just build, help build your reputation? Your, your view of yourself as a great spiritual father. And our next door neighbor came over a few months ago livid because she had found four-inch nails propped behind her tires of her car. Now, would, would my son admit to doing that? No. Another of my kid's recent antics. Out on a walk with mom, they were straggling behind. And so they decided to go around from door to door and take people's mail out of their mailbox <laughs> that they had just received. And so uh, finally everybody gets home and Linda sees all this mail. What are you guys doing? You know, so I, it's good that I'm not there as much as she is because... <laughs> my blood pressure would be a lot higher, I think. 
Our 18-month-old is a riot. I mean, he entertains the whole family. I mean, he, he will definitely be a ham. He already is. Um, again, the same next-door neighbor. Uh, <laughs> they just, their cat just had kittens. And uh, so they keep their garage door open about eight inches so that Mama Cat can run in and out and care for the kittens. Well, Linda turned her back for 10 seconds. Isaac goes scooting under there to go terrorize the kittens. And Linda didn't see where he went, and, and she looks all over the neighborhood. is just about to call the police when she walks by the garage and hears screaming kittens. And she can't fit under that eight inches, and so she shoves the four-year-old under there. Go get Isaac. Drag him over here. Slap his hands, pull him over here. You know, our four-year-old, he's, he's pretty gentle, you know, so he, he has this little monster brother to deal with. And so, uh, how do you balance all this stuff? Having, having a worship ministry, traveling all over the world, and having six kids, I don't know. I just sort of pray my way through it and uh, hope I'm doing the right thing. But you know what? I'm only going to have the kids for 20 years. I'll probably have ministry for 50. So I want to do as much as I can to raise my kids in a godly way while I have them. Let me give you some comparisons between the worship ministry and the family ministry to close us up here. The worship ministry is in front of the public doing an artistic spiritual activity while the family ministry is in front of the spouse and kids. They see the real you. The worship ministry, they see the spiritual you. The worship ministry, people think you're holy. In the family ministry, people have no illusions. <laughs> in the worship ministry, you challenge everyone to follow God. In the family ministry, they challenge you to follow God. <laughs> in the worship ministry, what you say and sing is important in the family ministry. What you do to demonstrate speaks a lot more loudly. In the worship ministry, your ministry and songs are the agenda. In the family ministry, your agenda can be interrupted at any time. In the worship ministry, people generally respect you. In the family ministry, they tolerate you. <laughs> in the worship ministry, our positions are temporary even though they might last many years. But in the family ministry, our positions are lifelong. In the worship ministry, somebody else can do the job, but in the family ministry, you're the only one that can do the job. In the worship ministry, uh, it pays good rewards, but the family ministry pays lifetime rewards. Let's pray. And could the band come just uh, for a closing song here? Take my life. In there. Let's just uh, turn our hearts to the Lord again. Lord, we give our hearts to you and, and we want to invest our lives as worshipers. Whatever that means for us, Lord. You've made so many different kinds and shapes and sizes and giftedness in the people that are here today, Lord. We just say to you now, Lord, we accept the way you've made us. We accept the role that you've given us in our churches. We acknowledge that you distribute the gifts. That you're the Father of all. 
Jesus be glorified. Help us to have in our lives your definition of success. That we might serve you, Lord, and not be too worried about how we look. Let's all stand. Holiness is what I long for. Holiness, holiness is what I long for. what I need. Holiness, holiness is what you want from me. Righteousness is what I long for. Righteousness, righteousness is what I long for. Righteousness is what I need. Righteousness, righteousness is what you want from me. Take my heart, take my heart and form it. Take my mind, transform it. what I long for. Faithfulness, faithfulness is what I long for. Faithfulness is what I need. Faithfulness, faithfulness is what you want. Let that be our worship. Living sacrifices to you. Placing ourselves on your altar, Lord. Being conformed to the image of Jesus. Lord, may the words of our mouths and the meditations of our heart be pleasing to you. And we realize that we're worshiping 24 hours a day, no matter what we're doing, honoring God with our bodies. Take my heart, take my mind, take my will, and take my life. Take my heart, take my heart, take my mind. Take my mind, take my will, take my will 
Generosity, kindness, forgiveness, joy and peace. Your will, not my will be done, Lord. Your will, not mine be done. Let's sing that together. Your will, not mine be done. Your will, not mine, be done. Wow. What a blessing, huh? Yeah. You can remain standing. We're about to dismiss you. Um, I had earlier in the service planned to do something, and I didn't do it. I'm really careful about... Uh, Self-promotion is something that musicians fight with all the time anyway. And uh, when the Lord brought revival to Brownsville, we were sort of over, well, not sort of, we were completely overtaken. Uh, we didn't know how to respond to every situation. We didn't know what to do. Uh, I came here with full intention of never making a record. That wasn't what I came here for. I moved here from Nashville. That's what I did when I was in Nashville. And I had no desire for it. I, matter of fact, had a bit of a distaste in my mouth for it. But the Lord kind of surprised us. And we found that, you know, again, I was so excited about vineyard music. I was just putting that in everybody's. We were ordering it at cost and selling it at cost just to get it in the hands of it because it wasn't available here at all. And, uh, and so we were just, I think we become one of your biggest order people. I mean, we just sell, 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 and we just had no desire to create a product. And uh, the people started coming up and saying, well, we love vineyard music, but we also love what's going on here. And I went, really? You sure? I think we're really not doing too good, but you like it? It's really surprising. And uh, so we, we, we put a little project together that we really did not intend for it. To, I wasn't even serious about it. We threw mics up in front of people who didn't even know the same lyrics, like I told you earlier. And uh, we had our house band, church band. We weren't no, had nobody in to do it. We just kind of threw it together. And uh, we were astonished at the way that, that it was received. And, you know, I'm a big one on entrustments. I believe in entrustments. I believe God gives you entrustments. 
and you don't necessarily ask for them, but he gives you entrustments. Give me two minutes. Stand with me for two minutes. I'll let you go. But give me your best here. When Andy said something, his last, next to last point, it sparked this in me, and I thought, well, all right, Lord, this is the time to do this. I want you to pray with us. Really, really pray with us. Because it is not a desire of ours to create another movement. We're in the Assemblies of God. This church is an Assembly of God church. Uh, we're not, and, and that's not even in their works. But musically, I'm not interested in creating another movement. I told the Lord that there are plenty of good worship leaders out there, and there's plenty of good worship music. But however, I find myself with an entrustment, and uh, I don't know exactly how to handle it. And uh, I'll be talking with Andy at lunch about how to handle it fully. But we felt directed of the Lord, and the Lord began to bring things together. And he brought a gentleman to work with me named Larry Day. I actually asked Larry to come down just to tell me what to do with all this product that was going out the back door because I felt an entrustment was placed. And, you know, if, if you're given a talent, and talents in the Bible talked about money, and you're given that, what do you do with it? Do you bury it and just go, when it's over, it's over? And that's what I had planned to do. And Larry came down and he said, well, you really need to get someone to distribute this. And I went, man, I really don't want to do that if we don't have to. And it's so funny. At that time, Larry was the uh, executive vice president of Diadem Records in Nashville. And God touched him and his wife and family. And they thought, and so one day I'm talking to Larry about just what should we do? And Larry said, well, you need somebody to come down and run that for you. And I said, I do. I said, I know. I, why don't you come? He said, okay. <laughs> I went, no. Really? You're going to leave that and come to Pensacola? And uh, he said, yeah, sure. So I said, okay, that's good. But let's see what the church says. Because our church, you know, the churches don't release you to do that sort of thing. I said, let's see what they say. And the board of directors of the church said, we believe in the vision, go. And I had no more excuses. <laughs> so what we're going to try to do here, and we're doing it in the side of the Lord and in the side of our church, it's under the umbrella of Brownsville Assembly of God, this local body, this local board governs, helps us govern and make decisions. But what we're doing is just as God moves here in Brownsville, we're recording projects and we're making them available. And they're available through Music Missions International. And what sparked this was Larry, Larry, Andy, started talking about the vision to go, want to go do other things in other countries. The whole purpose of even doing this is I said, okay, if we're going to do this, what are we going to do with the money? And uh, the Lord directed us to perpetuate worship. So what we're trying to do, even now, we've existed a year and what we're trying to do is just put together the vision strategy. And basically what it is, it's very simple. We want to be able to go into countries and support people like Andy and people with like vision to go in. And uh, I've worked in the Ukraine a lot. And though it's not a third world country, musically it's in a different vibe than we are at all here. I've made seven trips there before revival. And since revival, I've not been able to go. I'm hoping the time is coming soon where I can be released to do that. But the big thing is worship leaders and, and uh, equipment. They don't have guitars. They don't have, they can't go down to the shop and buy strings. Uh, they can't get heads for their drums. They can't get cymbals. They can't get sticks. And when they get them, they pay inflated prices and they don't have money for them. And you go, man, these are people who are willing worshipers and they're worshiping with what they have. How much better could they worship if we were able to take some of our bounty and share it? And so what we're doing is developing relationships with people who are doing that. And I will continue to travel myself in the near future to go out and oversee some of these things. But we want to basically, from our Bible school here, we have 705 students. And we've, we've, we've helped with a couple of trips. And we're trying to get everything together. We're having trips and people going out all the time. And we're trying to figure out how to logistically make all that happen, to put guitars on the plane with them and let them go to local church plants and leave them with the local church. And uh, that's what our vision is to do with the money. And uh, so we want you to pray with us.
please, I ask you, because you're like-hearted with us, you're musicians and worship leaders and pastors, and pray, we pray for your help. Remember us in prayer because we're trying to handle an entrustment that the Lord has given that we didn't ask for, but we know he has wisdom, and uh, I wanted to make ourselves vulnerable to you and just say we need your prayer. So if you, if you run across something at the bookstore from Music Missions International, it has Brownsville on it. We've got uh, an Awake America that came out uh, fall of last year, and uh, we're putting out a, a project called Send the Fire where we've gone back and revisited all the moves of God, and we've pulled a couple of songs from them, and we've put those together. I've got a worship leader from Scotland, actually, uh, Northern England, helping me lead worship on that, Bill, uh, Isabel Simpson, and uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. And uh, the coming the end of this year, we're hoping to go back to my roots a little bit and do uh, a compilation of some choir things that are coming out of Revival and uh, hopefully offer you some orchestrations and some lead sheets and things. We just want to service you. And uh, we can't do what Vineyard does, and we're not trying to. We're just trying to in handle the entrustment the Lord has given because there are people who will sing stuff from Brownsville that won't sing Vineyard. And there's people who will sing Vineyard that would never sing what we do. And so we're trying to realize our part in the body and just walk in it. So I ask your prayers. And that's all I wanted to say. That wasn't, I'm very cautious about that because I didn't bring here, you here to give you a sales pitch. But uh, please pray for us. And uh, please know that when you are helping us, that's what our vision is. And uh, also, Andy has product out there. And uh, any, any product we're carrying, that we carry normally as a vineyard product, I've asked them to give that over to Andy to bless his ministry because I believe in what he's doing and I believe when we bless Andy you know if the Lord speaks to you then again the, you're, you, you gave an offering to get here and we haven't received an offering but if the Lord speaks to you to uh, bless Andy I would like for you to do that I feel directed that you should uh, he's about to move he's never even told me any of this but he's about to move and, uh, and he's doing missions endeavors all the time so if the Lord speaks to you to sow into his ministry, God will bless you. It's a solid ministry that's been going a long time and uh, it has a long-range plan. God bless you. Miss Cheryl, did you need to talk to us about lunch? Thank you so much for your... Now, come back at one, one because this is exciting. We're going to do... This could either be the greatest thing that ever happened or it could be a total disaster. <laughs> and I want you to come and witness which one it is at one o'clock. All right, God bless you. That's all I was going to say. He did it. God bless. Enjoy your lunch. <laughs>